Welcome to Fort Vancouver National Historical Site. This fall, we're unable to hold this event safely, so we've put a group of our volunteers together to film a series of Park After Dark videos so you can learn more about people and places at Fort Vancouver. As we move into autumn, we hope you join us for this cozy evening. Fort Vancouver is a diverse community that includes Hudson's Bay Company officers, company employees, and their families. From 1825 to the mid-19th century, Fort Vancouver was regional headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company's Columbia Department. In the 1840s, this became an important stop on the Oregon Trail. 1845 was an important year for Fort Vancouver, and it was an important year for the National Park Service. The fort you see today is a reconstruction built on the archaeological footprint of the original, which stood here until it burnt down in the 1860s. When the National Park Service began the reconstruction in the late 1960s, they decided to recreate the fort as it appeared in 1845. But why 1845? 1845 was a year of great change for this community. When Fort Vancouver was built 20 years earlier, this territory was home to indigenous people, tribes, and nations. British trading posts like Fort Vancouver dotted the landscape. The 1830s had waves of disease due to the increasing presence of trappers and settlers. By the 1840s, missionaries and American immigrants were crossing the Oregon Trail. These American immigrants formed a new government south of the Columbia River and challenged the Hudson's Bay Company's influence in the Northwest. At the same time, fur demand in Europe was on a decline and the Hudson's Bay Company focused its attention to agricultural production. 1845 was an exciting time to be an American in the Pacific Northwest. Also a challenging time to be a Hudson's Bay Company employee. It was also a time of threat for Native American people as their lives would change forever. In this episode, we're gonna learn about the first store. And when we say store, we mean storage. So let's step inside and learn about the fur trading industry. Welcome to the first store. I'm Jeremy Schaefer, a volunteer here at the fort. I am working as a clerk at the first store. Hi, my name is Parker Schaefer. I am also a volunteer here and I am also working as a clerk here at the first store. We keep inventory here at the fort uh, in three separate books of everything coming in and out of the fort. Here at the first store, pretty much our goal is we have to receive everything from different forts as far south as uh, California, Mexico, as far east as the uh, Rocky Mountains, and as far north as Alaska. Everything comes into here, we open it up, we re inventory it, and then we repackage it and re inventory it, and that's what we send to Europe. On a normal day here at the fort, I would pretty much receive uh, smaller bundles of fur from other locations. I would open up that fur and then we would pr proceed to write down everything in our log that was in that fur package. Then we'd gather all that fur as well as multiple other furs and rewrap those into a larger bundle. Then that would be put on the ship and sent to Europe. We make sure to keep track of all of our logs and information in three books which are identical so then we send one across land one we keep here at, at the fort and one we send on the ship around to europe so then we make sure not to lose any of the information that we sent in any direction so when we bundle the furs we don't take all the beaver pelts because that's our most expensive commodity we take a little of everything as well as some tobacco leaves and we bundle that super tight together the great thing about the tobacco, it actually is, it works as a pesticide, keeps any insects from ruining our furs. The reason we use multiple furs in a bundle is if there's an issue on the ship or if one is down low and starts getting waterlogged, we don't lose all our best furs in one bundle. Before we put them on the ship or, or we're ready to ship them all off, we have large stacks and stacks of all the furs and bundles that we've got ready so then other laborers can take them down to the ships. So in our bundles, we have everything ranging from beavers to otters to wolverines to badgers to gray wolves and red foxes. And we wrap them all in bear fur and deer skin. The beaver felt actually one of the most interesting ones so that goes to get processed um, typically they pay children to pull the long guard hairs out of your beaver felt once all the guard hairs are removed 
They then take uh, mercury in a, a solution and run that over the fur to help pull all the fine hairs underneath the undercoat and then they scrape that off the pelt. So once they get that felt from the beaver, the hatter takes that then to create the hat. But these furs just don't just show up here magically. They've got to be going through a long process and a long journey to get from where they were in the wild down to right here in front of us. As a family of a trapper, you would accompany everyone going on one long trip and while the father or the male was out trapping, the women and children were back at camp and they were cooking and cleaning and making sure that all the pelts and furs were in order to be uh, dried and tanned as best they could. So earlier we talked about these books. Would you pass me one of those books? These books are important because they show what furs came from where and which outposts they came from, what type of fur they were, and how much, how many pounds of fur came from said outpost. It also keeps track of how many pounds of fur that we're sending off to England. Let's talk about some of the furs and what they were used for, such as the gray wolf was not a very expensive fur, but it made a great winter coat because the fur doesn't break when it freezes, unlike many of the other furs. The badger fur is used for shaving brushes and uh, paint brushes. They were uh, still used today. Some of the other furs, such as the mink, the silver fox, the fox, the link, were all used for women's clothing um, as cuffs, collars, pieces as well. So the beaver skin hat being so expensive, it gave you the opportunity to do business with people who normally wouldn't do business with you due to the amount of respect that they now gave you because of the hat. It showed that you either came from wealth or you gained wealth. In 1844, the Hudson's Bay Company did send fur off to England to different manufacturers, and that was the peak of the Hudson's Bay Company's fur trading days, and then everything began to change. So why it changed, in 1845, the silk hat became the new fashion, which pretty much killed the fur industry here, and Hudson Bay Company did have to go into other options to stay afloat. Those other options that the Hudson's Bay Company went into were cattle, lumber, and agriculture. In 1846, the Oregon Treaty was signed and the Hudson Bay Company moved to Canada. Um, it is still actually alive today. They have one of the longest running department stores and uh, still going. I hope we've given you some fun information that you can use in your daily life and your next stop on your trip is going to be over at the Counting House where you can learn more about Captain Bailey and the Clerks.